he knows anything at all. No employer is going to hire another worker to produce less of a product than they had before. You're paying out money, you're getting less, less return. Obviously idiotic. Uh, also, nobody, no workers, gonna, nobody's going to be hired on the line here. Because on the line, uh, the marginal product is zero. You're hiring a worker for a certain amount of money, you get no, no more, you know, zero increase in product. You're not going to do that either. So zone three is verboten. In other words, the whole, because what happens in zone three is there are too many workers per fixed capital. There's too many, there's so many workers per land and per cap, per capital equipment that producing a lower product all the time, or even, or no more product. So nobody's going to operate in zone, no factor will be employed in zone three. <clears throat> That's pretty self-evident. The problem with zone one, zone one is a little trickier. I went through that whole thing, but the point with zone one is, in the area of zone one, the fixed factors are too, are too, Excessive compared to the number of workers. You have so few workers per land and capital good. The workers have to rush around trying to use all of them. They, they, you wind up with a lower average product. And the marginal product is negative. The marginal product for fixed factors is negative in zone one. And on the line, the marginal product is zero for, the, for fixed factors. So that if you take, if you have one, two workers are trying to, trying to, uh, row wheat in 10,000 acres, you get more wheat if you cut out half the acreage. If you simply cut them out, so the workers can have to find themselves a, a smaller amount of land and be much better at it. So in other words, here you have an excessive amount of the variable factor. So the marginal product of the variable factor, labor in this case, is, is negative. And here the marginal product of the fixed factor is negative. And therefore, nobody employed, no factor will be employed in this zone either. So you wind up with a conclusion that all factors of production, land, labor, and capital, will always be employed in zone two. For any product whatsoever. In other words, in the area where the, of diminishing returns, where average product, physical product is declining, marginal physical product is declining, but less, but greater than zero. Uh, okay, so this is um, this doesn't need empirical testing either. This can be, I say, those who want to do it can do it, but it's, it's not necessary. It's part of the logic of reality. <coughs> so. Um, Next step is to demonstrate what the, what the demand curve is. This is what we're trying to get at here. Uh, the employer, of course, is interested not so much in physical production. He's interested in selling it and getting an income. So we have to bring in the price system. By the way, in, in general, in, in, in economics, as you go through, go continue in life, you'll, you'll read economics willy-nilly from time to time, or the financial pages or whatever. Remember, any, any model of the economy doesn't mention the price system as crackpot. Prices have got to show up somewhere. If they don't show up, for example, much of macroeconomics Prices drop out, don't talk about prices. Be very suspicious of any economic model or theory that doesn't mention prices. Prices are the key to the whole system. So similarly here, what happens is the employer is interested in, in total revenue and total cost, of course, maximizing profit. Uh, in the case of revenue, he's interested in uh, factors of production which will bring him greater revenue. So um, the... Uh, we have total revenue, of course, as we know, is price times the price of the product times the quantity produced. So if you sell um, Wonder Bread for a buck a loaf, you sell a thousand loaves of Wonder Bread, you're getting a thousand bucks. So that's how money in the price system comes into the picture. And uh, so now we're looking at what is the marginal revenue productivity of each factor of production, of each worker, of each piece of land, etc. How much money is brought in by the product? So what you do is you multiply, <coughs> in the case of marginal, so here you have marginal physical product delta Q over delta alpha. And the marginal <coughs> revenue, which is how much each loaf of bread, wonder bread, brings into the firm and, and money, money terms, is equal to delta TR divided by delta Q. In other words, you sell one more loaf of wonder bread or one more uh, high fry set, and you get certain total revenue coming in. You sell it for, you know, whatever it is, you get money out of it. If you multiply these two things, MPP times MR, delta Q drops out, and you get delta TR divided by delta alpha. In other words, how much money is brought in, how much <coughs> income or revenue is brought in by each, each, each one more worker or one more piece of land or one more machine. So this is the marginal revenue product. So the marginal physical product times the marginal revenue. Uh, on averages, average physical product, Q 
divided by alpha, you know, the number of uh, bushels, of, bushels of wheat per worker, let's say, times, then you have average revenue, which is TR divided by Q, which, by the way, is the same thing as the demand curve. That's what price is. This is the price curve or the demand curve. Remember, this is uh, our friend, old friend of the demand curve. This is the average revenue curve. This is price. This is quantity. And remember, price times quantity is total revenue. So this is the price curve or the demand curve. Marginal revenue curve is also falling and below it. <coughs> So this, you, these, and this, when you multiply average physical product times average revenue, at least the quantity drops that, and you're left with TR per alpha. In other words, total revenue per, per worker, let's say, which, which is the same thing as average revenue, revenue product. So in other words, revenue product, how much total income is brought in by each worker or each machinery, comes into the picture by multiplying the physical product times the price or times the marginal revenue. <coughs> That's how the money, the money system is brought into the picture. Uh, my final contention was on Tuesday that this is that the demand curve for by the employer for every factor of production will be the marginal revenue product curve. And this is the well, uh, so looking now the demand curve for workers or, or or machines or land. This is say price or wage rate in the case of workers. <coughs> This is the quantity hired, alpha, or quantity bought, whichever it is. What I'm contending is that the demand curve of the firm or the industry or whatever for workers is the same thing as the marginal revenue product curve. Because um, the employer, when the employer is trying to hire a worker, let's say, you're comparing the cost and the benefit, you're comparing the revenue brought in by the worker with the cost paying out. Remember, you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, uh, <coughs> Act at each point where you're making a profit <clears throat> and maximizing your profit. Well, if the, so if the wage rate, let's say, is five dollars an hour, this is the market wage rate, which for a certain type of labor, um, the employer has to pay. Uh, if you're, this is let's say, 100 workers, and wage rate is five dollars, that's how much you're paying out. And if the, if the worker brings in the marginal worker, in other words, the marginal one more worker will bring in at the margin seven bucks an hour. Um, if that's the productivity. Then uh, he's making a pro employee is making an extra profit of two dollars per hour on each additional worker. So you keep hiring workers as long as the uh, you know, as long as you make a profit. As long as the revenue product is greater than the, on the, on the wage rate. As long as the money you're taking in is greater than the money you're shelling out. So you keep hiring more workers so long as this is positive. You're tapping the surplus, so to speak. And, but each time you hire more, more workers, since the marginal revenue product curve is falling, you get less and less of a profit. So you finally wind up with equality. Actually, you really stop over here. It's one of my arguments with micro theory. You really stop, say, over here. But for our purposes, you don't have to, you don't have to go into that. What you do is you keep going until you've, you, until you've maximized your profit. Until, the, until you get to the point where you just, just let's make te a teeny bit more from the worker than you're paying out. And after that, and you stop before you make losses, if, you, if you're, if you're, uh, let's say this is 200. If you're hiring 300 workers, you get, and you're in a situation since the margin, MRP is falling all the time, so you have diminishing returns, then you have a situation you're paying out five dollars, you're only getting, getting three dollars in revenue pie. You're losing two dollars per worker per each for each additional worker. So you, you fire them, you get back to the situation, you avoid your losses, you, you again you get back to here. Once again, you have a built-in feedback mechanism, so to speak, which keeps the Number employed, or a number hired, or a number bought, whatever it happens to be, uh, equal to the marginal revenue product of a factor. So, in other words, if the wage rate is up here, you hire this many, if it's down here, you hire this many, if it's down here, you hire that many, etc., etc. And we've already seen the definition of a demand curve. The definition of any demand curve is given the price. This will show you how much will be purchased or hired in this case. Uh, given the price. And the lower the price, the more will be purchased or higher, et cetera, et cetera. So we've already seen when we talked about minimum wage law that the demand curve for labor is falling. Now we're showing why it's falling, exactly what, how it's falling, and what, what determines it is the marginal revenue product curve, which is also falling. Because if you have a falling marginal physical product curve, falling in the relevant zone two, and a falling marginal, since the marginal revenue curve is always falling, because the demand curve is always falling, you multiply these two, you get a falling marginal revenue product curve.
multiply two falling curves, you have to line up with a third falling curve, okay? As the, as the product. So, this is the demand curve for the factors of production. It's the marginal revenue product curve for labor, different kinds of labor, for capital goods, raw materials, and land. All these things are, this is the so-called marginal revenue product, or so, for short, it's called a marginal productivity theory. Um, marginal revenue productivity theory is the correct word, but it could be, uh, you know, just say marginal productivity theory for short. And some people have challenged this thing somehow, it's bad, evil or whatever it is. This is simply the fact. In other words, that any, any price of factors, including wage rates, will, will equal the marginal revenue product uh, curve. Uh, this determines the demand curve for labor or land or capital. Then, of course, you have the supply curve. <coughs> and uh, it's, uh, so you have the demand curve for labor which, or, or, or any factor, which is marginal revenue product, or you have a supply curve, which is whatever. You wind up with a market equilibrium wage rate or price, rent of, cap of land or price of capital goods or whatever. Okay, so this is the summation of what we said to that thing. I had to do that because I was throwing too much at you. <clears throat> and uh, what we'll now do is investigate the labor market in particular, which is the most important of the factor markets. Actually, obviously, of course, we're interested in people. We're interested in late and what happens to wage rates, why they're what they are, and what determines them. <clears throat> um, the uh, in the case of labor, you do not get a really a, you do not really get a vertical supply curve. Uh, land will have a vertical supply curve or, or any given, uh, or, or capital equipment. In case of labor, however, nobody's going to work 40 hours a week or whatever for a penny an hour. You want know, to stay home. In other words, leisure is always an alternative. So, it's something like that. In other words, you at least get something like this. With a sharp falling off of the supply of labor curve as you get into a low wage rate area. <clears throat> and the greater the unemployment insurance or the welfare payment, the higher this is going to be. A bigger floor you've got. On, on how much wage rate people will accept. <clears throat> so, uh, also another thing, uh, and then it, gets, it gets more complicated by the fact that some people are not in the labor force. Uh, I think I've already mentioned this when I dealt with unemployment, the minimum wage law. Labor, the, the whole population is not, the labor force is defined as those who are employed or seeking employment. So it's a sort of a variable thing because some people are retired, other people are babies, you know, so there's, there's a lot of play in the system. For example, the last 20 years or so, or 10 years, a lot of housewives, of course, have entered the labor force. So uh, you have a, people who are, the population might have stayed the same or gone up a little bit. The labor force is going way up for that reason, okay, for that, for that particular reason. So um, there's a tendency, of the, even on the short run, to have a, a forward sloping supply curve for labor because uh, if you raise wage rates enough, people will stop being housewives and join the labor force. Okay, in other words, there's a as, a, as an incentive to, uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit dependent on babysitter prices or whatever you want to call it, uh, daycare prices or something. You get, to raise wage rates, say, for women considerably above the babysitting price or daycare price, you'd have more women entering the labor force. Wage rates go down, less of them will enter. So generally there'll be a forward sloping supply curve for labor even in the immediate, you know, short run, <clears throat> even day to day. <clears throat> um, so, we can have a little bit something like this. Uh, now this, this, this general supply curve will change for each industry, for each firm. In other words, uh, this is true for labor for any other factor. If you remember, if you multiply the, the uh, alternatives open for you, then you have a more elastic, you get, it becomes the curve. Consumers, the demand curve for, uh, remember for Wonder Bread is much flatter than the demand curve for bread as a whole. Similarly, the supply curve of labor, say, to one industry will be much flatter, more elastic than the supply curve of labor in general. In other words, as I said, if plumbers, there's a big increase in demand for plumbing, let's say, and the wage rates for plumbing go up, you'll have people going in, you have a more a flatter supply curve of plumbing, a supply curve of labor to an industry. It's flatter. If you raise the wage rates, more people will be brought into plumbing or computer engineer or whatever, the lower people got out of it. This is a more longer run thing, of course, I admit that. Get a long run perspective. And similarly, the supply curve to each firm will be very quite flat. So if Ford increases its wage rates compared to General Motors, people tend to leave General Motors and go into Ford and vice versa. So the supply curve of labor to a firm will be flatter than the supply curve of labor to an industry or to labor in general. 
Um, so labor is partially mobile, and, and it's not completely mobile, but it is mobile uh, to a large extent. In many cases, of course, people leave, it's not that you leave an industry at the age of 50. I mean, farmers, there's been an overall shift over the last two centuries from the farm to, to the city. It's not that every farmer drops the pitchfork and leaves. It's that the sons of the farmers growing up leave the farm and go to the, go to the city. So the most mobile labor force, of course, are, are teenagers or people just entering labor force. They're much more mobile than people who have been in the, in the business for 20 years. And general, so generally the mobility takes place among young people. They're the ones who are freer to move the leaf and go to California and all the rest of it. So you have mo you don't need everybody to be mobile for this thing to work. All you need is some people. And uh, that's what, exactly what they do. They leave for opportunities. They leave Michigan and go to California and sort of go to Texas and stuff like that. Uh, in England, there's much lower mobility. People tend to, if they're born in Shropshire, they live in Shropshire until they die and they never leave, never see beyond 20 miles, if that. So uh, there are different cultures which have different rates of mobility, so to speak. <coughs> uh, <coughs> okay, the, uh, historically, over time, what ha tends to happen is that capital equipment per worker goes up. In other words, you have, you have, uh, you start with Crusoe, if you remember way back in like the first hour, we talked about Crusoe. You start with Crusoe, you have one stick, that's his capital equipment, and one net, okay? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, or a bow and arrow or something. Now we've got, over the centuries, we've accumulated lots of capital equipment. And as we do that, it increases the productivity of the labor force. In other words, if this is the marginal productivity of labor, okay, and it keeps increasing over the years because there's more capital equipment and better technology of capital per worker. That's really the key. In other words, you have a labor force, of course, goes up, but you have an even greater increase in capital equipment and productive capital equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So the result of that, you have a, a fall in the price of machinery, fall in the price of capital equipment, and a fall in the price, of course, of consumer goods, and an increase in, the, in, the, in wage rates. In other words, demand for labor, as the, as the productivity of labor increases over time. Okay, this is demand for labor, we're not talking about fireplace. We're not talking about wage rate specifically. Over time, the history of capitalist development is a history of increase of capital equipment and technology, high technology, et cetera, which constantly increases the demand curve for labor and thereby increasing the wage rate. So this is the supply of labor. You have something like that. But over time, you have a continual increase in what's known as real wage rates. It means wage rates per purchasing power, not just in money terms, which could be inflationary, but in real terms, you buy, you can buy more and better stuff. The standard of living goes up. The reason why the standard of living goes up over the century, especially since the Industrial Revolution, since the mid-18th century, is when a continuing increase of capital investment, capital equipment, and, and, you know, technology embodied in capital equipment. Technology by itself won't do anything. The Romans probably had a lot of high-tech development. They, they never, they didn't apply it much to real, to real life. So just inventions isn't enough. You have to apply them in industry <coughs> and capital investment. <coughs> Embody them, so to speak, in capital investment. <clears throat> so what you have over time, tendency is to have uh, higher wage rates with more more jobs. In other words, there's room for more people as you keep increasing the demand curve for labor. Uh, so the way you have increased employment at higher wage rates. And this is this is a labor market. And um, so this rests what, what all this mostly rests on is increased capital equipment development, capital accumulation at a and higher technology embodied in capital accumulation. So for this, you need savings, you need investment, and all the rest of it. You need a, a capitalist function to do this. Uh, and um, so over time, then you have more more jobs at higher wage rates. Now, this is the this is the history of the 19th and 20th century, fortunately. <clears throat> okay. The uh, so the route. This is one route to higher wage rates. The other route. Possible route to higher wages is the route taken by restrictionism, like cartels. Of, this takes cartels of labor, uh, called labor unions. Namely, what you try to do, given the uh, demand for labor, instead of increasing, instead of promoting the idea of increased capital investment with higher wage rates through jobs, what you try to do is restrict the supply of labor, push it to the left in some way, thereby increasing the wage rate at the expense of those who are displaced. In other words, you take, you take the labor force, you restrict it in some, one way or the other, and you'll see various ways in which it's done, and thereby decreasing wage rates for some people and increasing wage rates for others at their expense. This is a restrictionist solution, so to speak. Uh, you, 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 
In this method, the method of capital investment, you're increasing the number of jobs and increasing capital, uh, wage rates. In this method, you decrease the number of jobs and increase wage rates. So what you're doing is you're excluding a bunch of people, either immigrants through immigration restrictions or uh, through unions, non-union people who are pushed into other lower occupation, lower wage occupations. <coughs> so this is the, uh, <coughs> in the labor market, this is the way it's done. You can't, unions don't have any, uh, unions can't determine wage rates. They can't say, okay, we, we decide to have 50% wage increase. If they did that, they could do it unlimitedly, you know, just like the minimum wage law. Union can come and say, we want quadruple the wage rate for everybody. Okay, we'll do it. Can't do that because the firms will go out of business. So what, the way it's done is, by trying to control the labor force, restricting it and pushing wage rates up at the expense of other workers. So what you have in real life, in contrast to the Marx, Marxist myth that you have a group of capitalists on the one hand with common class interests, a group of workers on the other hand with common class interests, and the two are at war, just the opposite. Capitalists are competing among themselves through goods and services and all that, and workers compete among themselves for, for jobs and wages, etc. So the, the cartel of uh, uh, workers, uh, unions are very much like a cartel of, wage, of workers, uh, and <clears throat> a similar, similar aim of cutting, cutting the supply and raising the wage rate. <clears throat> um, we'll see how that can be done the, uh, next time. But they, so we'll have to have a 10 minute break and continue on with the union question. What unions try to do is, con is control the labor market. You know, control the market for their particular labor. If they can keep out entry in one way or the other and raise the, they can then wage, raise the wage rate. Uh, the economic power of the union, and I will define economic power as the ability not to just make noise, but the ability to raise wage rates above the non-union level. Right? Economic power then is very different from publicity. Uh, the powerful unions are usually the ones that are small, highly skilled craftsmen, other people who have a very small uh, craft, and uh, where you need a, a, a long, long years of apprenticeship to be uh, good at it, and uh, which is small part of the labor force. In other words, um, it depends again, the power of the union depends a, a lot on the elasticity of the demand curve for labor. In other words, if, let's take, uh, let's say the automobile workers union, where it's probably pretty elastic. Let's take ditch diggers, very elastic. Uh, <laughs> almost anybody with a good pair of arms and shoulders can be a ditch digger. It does not take 10 years of degrees and stuff like that, okay? so. <laughs> You have an elasticity of demand for it. So if you, this is the demand for ditch diggers, and you have a ditch diggers union, which pushes the wage rate, we demand 50% wage increase, then you get something like, you know, the, the, the quantity of labor hired falls off drastically. We have huge unemployment. This breaks the union. In other words, the union's not going to last very long if you demand a certain wage rate increase, and, you, and even if you get it, you have 80% unemployment in the industry. The unemployed ditch diggers go and just undercut the union at the end of it. So in other words, all, any union, any union, any successful union raising wage rate will cause unemployment. The point is that they cause a lot of it, it will destroy the union. <clears throat> That's why there's no ditch diggers union, otherwise, no successful ditch diggers union. So what you have, these successful unions will tend to be those which have an inelastic demand curve for that particular labor. So that if you raise the wage rate, let's say this is the supply curve of labor, if you push the supply curve to the left, some way, you raise the wage rate, will cause some unemployment, but not too much, maybe 5% or 10% or whatever. And the best you're going to hope for is there'll be no visible unemployment. All you do is eliminate jobs for teenagers coming in, so you won't see unemployment. There just, just won't be any jobs available. It would have been available without the union increase. So to do that, you have to have, a, to have an inelastic demand curve for labor. You have to have certain conditions. One of them is, well, one, you have to control the labor force just to get there in the first place. But another one is, it should be a small percentage of the total cost of the, of the business small percentage of the payroll, so to speak. To give you an idea, there's a beautiful example from the history of poly here. We used to have uh, two mighty unions here, <laughs> two uh, mass, massive unions, so to speak, the faculty union called the American Association of University Professors, which represented the entire, <laughs> represented the, represented the entire faculty of 280, whoever it was, and the staff union, which still exists, the, I think it's part of District 65 of a wholesale retail clerk union, something like that. They represent the staff, secretaries, and et cetera. So they're the mass union, so to speak, within Poly. They have 200 members, 150 members, whatever. They, can, they have never succeeded in increasing wage rates at all. As a matter of fact, we barely, usually fall behind the cost of living increase. We had a, uh, a faculty union for many years. They used to spend a lot of time on bargaining. This is typical. They used to have hundreds and hundreds of man hours of hysteria, 
bargaining, conflict, hatred, and so forth, and they wind up three years after the fact. In other words, in 1980, we'd be still bargaining for 1977 wage increases. And we get finally get 7%, and, uh, which would usually be the cost of living, you know, the inflation rate. So after the union was, was dissolved, after the union was kicked out by the administration, we still get, we still got the 7%, actually we got less than that, we still got the cost of living increase without any bargaining time lost. In other words, the whole thing was more or less a net loss <coughs> of uh, general conflict, energy, and all the rest of it. On the other hand, the only successful union in this place is a teeny union, which nobody ever heard of, the Boiler Tenders Local. I think there were three boiler tenders. There's one boiler, and <laughs> there's three, two or three boiler tenders as long as the boiler tenders lo local, whatever it is, the boiler tenders union. So one time they had a little strike. It's kind of funny. They had one picket way off from the corner, you know, around the corner, so nobody could see them. It said, on strike, very decorous little strike, well, on strike, local 38 or whatever, the boiler tenders union. So in those days, we had a mighty and powerful faculty and staff union. We went, <laughs> allegedly powerful, and we went to them, and we said, would you like solidarity? He wants to pick it with you. He wants to help propagandize leaflet. Go away. Leave us alone. <laughs> we don't want to have nothing to do with you people. Okay. And so after about three weeks of a very decorous strike, the boiler tender's strike was settled. They got a 50% wage increase. Why? Because only two or three guys. I mean, Polly can afford to give a 50% increase to three people. They can't afford to give 50% to 200 people. That's the difference. In other words, if you have a teeny union in the interstices of the labor force, so to speak, and I, feel, I don't know how much how skill it is. There's only some skill involved in boiler tending. And so, and you have a small labor force that's sort of in the pocket of a situation and an employer can afford to give you a big increase. <clears throat> These are the successful unions before the, during the free lab, days of the free labor market, even now. In other words, the sort of unions which made it, <clears throat> which were able to raise the you know, wage rate for their employees, were unions that are small, skilled craft, uh, but it can restrict the labor force. For example, stonemasons. There are very few stonemasons left. It's a magnificent, lovable craft, and unfortunately it's sort of dying out. The only stonemasons are elderly Italians who were, who were trained in Italy, I think. And they're getting, you know, they're getting fairly old by this time, so there are only about five stonemasons, whatever, in the United States. They have a strong union, because what the hell? I mean, how many stonemasons are hired? You can afford to have a big increase. So at any rate, so what you have then, <coughs> In the free labor market before 1935, in other words, from 1880s to 1935, they had more or less a free labor market. There was no government intervention in the, in the union in the labor market. In this period of a free labor market, the only unions which were successful were those with skilled, so-called craft unions, skilled, small unions with, which can restrict their labor force, which are a small percentage of the payroll, <coughs> glass blowers, cigar band workers, uh, stonemasons, particularly in the building trade, construction, which is still true, by the way, the um, joiners, plumbers, carpenters. And the thing about the building trades is that, in a sense, they're, local, they're monopolistic within each locality. In other words, if you're, let's say, in the garment business or the printing business, and you unionize, your costs go up or your prices go up, uh, business can shift to North Carolina, which it does happen. They have, a, they have a garment factory in New York. It's unionized, their costs are high. And the buyers simply go to, you know, somebody sets up a clothing factory in North Carolina, which is non-union. They undercut the current New York plan. The whole the New York plan goes bankrupt. The union goes bust. But in construction, it's, 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 you can't do it that way. In other words, Chicago construction or Houston construction doesn't really compete with New York construction. You're not going to leave New York to, 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 to become a construction person and real estate person in Chicago. So it's more or less geographically monopolistic, so to speak, construction. Therefore, unions have been able to take root the building trades or construction more than any other uh, industry, more than any occupation. You have a whole bunch of construction, the say unions, craft unions, carpenters, machinists, electricians, joiners, uh, a whole bunch of the masons, etc., etc. All heavily restrictionist, monopolistic. Now, these firms, these unions, control their labor force with a mighty will. <clears throat> they increase their wage rates at the expense of other non-members. How do they do it? They cut the supply. In other words, you can't be, at least until recently, I don't know what it is, with all the affirmative action sort of stuff, but before, let's say, a few years ago, at least, you could not join the carpenters' union, electricians' union, plumbers' union, say, in New York or in Jersey City or whatever, unless you were the son or nephew of an existing union member, period. And all non-sons and non-nephews are ex excluded. In other words, you have very sharp restriction. As a result, you can increase your wage, if you have an inelastic demand curve, it's even better, you can increase your wage rate at the expense of those who would like to become carpenters, joiners, electricians, who can become supermarket clerks instead. In other words, they're driven in, they're pushed into non-union 
or non-powerful union occupations. So if you want to be an electrician, let's say, in Hoboken, you can't do it. If you're not a son or a nephew of a union member, you can't do it. You just can't be an electrician. You have to either move to Texas or California or become a supermarket clerk or a gas station attendant. So what happens is, in other words, is these, uh, these unions have been accused of being racist. Well, in a sense, they're racist, but they also they hate all, not only other races, but they discriminate not only against other races, but against non-relatives. That's what it amounts to. <laughs> Non-sons and non-nephews. Now, in recent years, women have entered the construction trade, so it's I guess a little bit of loosening up on this, but it's still, I think, basically true that unions are highly, these craft unions are highly restrictive. So what happens is that this is a union membership, this is a craft union uh, occupation. You, you, you cut the supply, cut the supply drastically to the left by restricting the supply of, say, electricians to only relatives. Then you increase your wage rate. These people, however, are excluded. These people would have been electricians, like to be electricians are pushed into other non-union industries. So they become, let's say, supermarket clerks or something like that, which increases the supply of labor in the supermarket clerks or in gas station attendants. So the wage rate goes down. In other words, what these unions are doing, they're increasing the wage rates of their members at the expense of lower wage rates for other people, for competing workers, so to speak. <clears throat> There's no overall increase in wage rates over the entire labor force. But unions, do they, if, they, if they can do it at all, they can accomplish the raising wage rates for their members at the expense of other occupations who suffer lower wage rates. So what you have is competition between within the labor force. It's not so much employers that get hurt by union restrictions, it's other workers who are not relatives, or not who don't have to be fortunate enough to be son of an existing union member. Um, so before 1935 in the free labor market, the unions took hold on uh, craft, okay, and construction industry in particular, anthracite coal, in contrast to bituminous coal, which is what most coal is, bituminous coal is all over the place. It's you know, all over the eastern seaboard, in West Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, whatever. It's also in the mountain states. Anthracite coal is only in the little, little area of eastern Pennsylvania around Scranton. And so it's very easy then. It's geographically monopolistic, so to speak. And so it was easy to organize a powerful anthracite coal union, which was done could then be restricted and all the rest of it. <clears throat> but not in bituminous coal, which only came in after 1935 when the government intervened heavily in the labor, labor market. <clears throat> so um, the only other, let's see, construction, anthracite, a few skilled crafts, glass blowing and things like that. Um, and the other, only other one I can think of at the moment is the Musicians Union, a strange paradox. Apparently the thing with musicians this is so true. Actors, the acting, the stagehands union and the, the theater, very, very powerful craft unions. Uh, they suffer very heavy unemployment. In other words, they push up the wage rate enormously, so that the uh, um, unemployment in musicians industry is like 80, 90 percent. Same way with actors. The actors are mostly waiters at you know, restaurants, things like that. They wait for their big break. So apparently, acting and, mus and theater musicians is such that. People love to play music to such an extent, or love to be in a theater, they're willing to accept the 90% unemployment rate. So most of the time, hanging around on menial occupations, waiting for that big break. In that sort of situation, they don't break the union, in other words. It's a very, it's a very, it's sort of a bizarre, eccentric kind of occupation. Uh, I, I learned labor, labor economics from a former union economist who was very knowledgeable, very savvy and all this, and he went down this list and he said, well, musicians are, how come musicians are break the mold? How come they, they can have a big unemployment rate? Wouldn't be tolerated, say, in FSI coal or construction. So, well, musicians are crazy anyway. <laughs> Everybody knows that. <laughs> anyway, that's the reason. In other words, they're they're willing to accept a union wage rate, which which unemploys most of them most of the time because they're waiting for that big break. So, this is uh, these are really the only the only uh, unions that were successful before 1935. Within that framework, it was a very small percentage of the labor force. Obviously, in other words, um, between 1880s. So 1885, let's say 1935, proportion of union membership to total labor force was varied between three and eight percent, something like that. A very small proportion. In other words, this, the union problem, whatever it is, was, was fairly limited. It was limited mostly as I say, construction, emphasis, and emphasis like coal. And um, the rest of the time, within this three and eight percent, it would fluctuate in accordance with the business cycle. In other words, in the boom periods. Okay. Have a boom period, the demand for labor goes up, and so it's increased wage rates. So, in other words, wage rates go up in a boom, an inflationary boom period. 
and the unions took the credit for it. They say, hey, look, we're, we're increasing our wage rates in the clothing industry. People join the union because of that. And then it comes a recession. Demand for labor goes down again. Wage rates would fall on the free market. The unions try to keep the wage rates up. There's heavy unemployment, and this breaks the union. So what you have then, within the 3 and 8%, the 3 to 8% would reflect on the business cycle. In other words, a recession would be down to 3%, and then a boom would go up to 8%, and then go back down. It would fluctuate with the business cycle in a very, within a very small range, less, way less than 10%. It would fluctuate in accordance with this business cycle factor. Uh, so unions would always collapse in recessions, because the reality would hit, wage rates would fall, and they would try to keep the wage rates up, and bingo, the whole thing would collapse. <clears throat> so, um, so even though historians like to talk about unions, for one thing, they're usually ideologically in favor of them. For another thing, it's sort of dramatic. They have a strike and very, makes the headlines, but it really wasn't that important. Uh, it really only covered a small percentage of the, of the workforce. <clears throat> and uh, what happens then is that with World War I, every, I mean, with the, the New Deal period, 1930s, everything shifts. There's a massive government intervention which still exists. Um, the... Um, The massive intervention of two, basically two major pieces of intervention. One was 1932 uh, with the Norris LaGuardia Act, and uh, which still exists, which outlaws injunctions for labor disputes. Um, outlaws the use of the injunction. Outlaws the injunction. Uh, injunction is a weapon that came in in the court system in the early 19th century. Um, mm -hmm. So usually, if somebody's aggressing against you, somebody you know stealing your, your watch or something, you call the cops, you, you, you try to punish them or prevent them to get the watch back or whatever. Uh, in other cases, however, you have a continuing pattern of aggression. In other words, let's say somebody's always driving a, a truck across your lawn. Let's say there's a traffic jam in your corner, and the trucks would like to sort of go across your lawn so they can avoid the traffic, and they do it. And some truck keeps doing it week after week. You go to court, get an injunction. In other words, and the judge says. Thou shalt not do it. If you do it again, we crap you in jail or whatever. So the injunction is a way of preventing a continuing pattern of, of, of uh, aggression or, or, or violation of your rights. <clears throat> it's a very important weapon of, of the courts, which didn't exist before about 1810 or so. Well, in the Norris LaGuardia Act, the way injunctions came in in labor disputes is, uh, on a strike situation, you go on strike, what you're doing is you're saying, we won't work anymore for the, your company until you give us a 20% wage increase or whatever. Uh, the employer's tendency is to say, all right, nuts to you, we'll hire somebody else. If you don't want to work for you know, $3 an hour or whatever, we'll hire people who will, will work. And, that's, and that immediately creates a problem for the strikers who we'll then proceed to try to beat up the one with the other, prevent non-strikers non from, from, taking, from, from quote, taking their jobs, in other words, from doing the work uh, at a rate which strikers don't want to do. So in other words, essential to the victory of, of any strike uh, for the union is to use violence against non-striking workers, against replacement workers, known as scabs in the, in the vernacular. So uh, in order to keep scabs out or keep uh, non-strikers out, uh, they have massive picket lines which intimidate people or beat them up or blow up their homes or their cars and stuff like that. So in other words, violence and labor issues is almost always done by the union. The reason is because and the, the, the only way you can really win a, win a strike is to prevent uh, non-strikers from replacing you. Uh, employers don't really have any incentive to commit violence except as a defensive weapon to try to keep their, their plan in order and try to keep the non-strikers from being beaten up. <clears throat> so generally, as an a priori insight, in most labor disputes, most of the violence is, violence is committed by the unions. <clears throat> uh, I, I have all sorts of personal stories of this sort, which still, still exist, by the way. Um, the... Uh, a few years ago, I was a student in this class who was working for Con Ed. It was a Con Ed strike. And the plan at Con Ed was down in Madison Avenue or something, somewhere midtown Manhattan. And the union sort of established control over who could get in and out. In other words, the union said, well, we'll allow managers to, to stay in. And we'll allow managers to keep the Con Ed going. We won't allow any managers to come back in if they leave. They had to stay there for the three weeks, you know, whatever the length of the strike is. They allow food to be shipped in. Very, very nice of them. <laughs> they allow them to send food in, but they won't allow they won't allow the managers to come back. They have to stay there physically and sleep there and sort of stuff. So. Fortunately, it's only lasted a week or two. My father, unfortunately, was in this situation. He was um, he was a, a chief chemist of what was then Tidewater Oil Company, now part of Getty. 
now part of, I don't know, what, Texaco, I guess, or something. <laughs> anyway, this Tidewater Oil Company had a plant in Bayonne, New Jersey, and uh, the union went on strike. The union was a so-called company union, which according to the textbooks must be a weak, dominated union, weak, you know, the tool of the employers. They were not a tool of the employers at all. They were very feisty. And so they called a strike, and oil, oil refineries have to keep going. You can't shut them down because it'll take a couple of years to bring them up again. You have to keep a maintenance plant going. So, um, so the managers were allowed to stay there and run, you know, keep the plant going. However, they weren't, weren't allowed to come back in. The union wouldn't allow it. The union establishes control over the, over the territory, so to speak. The cops, of course, looked the other way. And uh, so they, they allowed food to be shipped in. In this case, my poor father was there for about three months. I mean, literally, the three-month strike. And they were like prisoners, like being in a concentration camp, uh, being allowed to stay in this crummy dump. I mean, the refinery is not a sort of a luxury resort, <laughs> if you've ever seen an oil refinery. So, uh, in other words, the union seizes control. Instead of the police performing their alleged function of, of, of preventing violence and keeping the peace, the police abandon this responsibility to turn over the, the rule over the street, so to speak, to the, to the union. <clears throat> so, at any rate, so this is fairly common and still, and really still is, except in the South, for example, which always had a sound attitude to the union, <laughs> union question. Uh, namely, if they don't, the police prevent any kind of union violence. Where the, prevent, where the police really prevent union violence, strikes usually collapse. There's usually very little union power uh, for that reason. Um, a famous case of that is the Kingsport strike in Kingsport, Tennessee, about 10, 15 years ago. It's, very, it's a very interesting, very illustrative kind of situation at Kingsport. Kingsport was a, ten, a modern plant in Tennessee, in, in Appalachia country. And, um, and here's this plant which was hiring at the top wage rate of the area. Beautiful working condition, great place. Everybody wanted to work for the Kingsport printing plant. High unemployment in the area. It's Appalachia, which is, next time I'll, I'll tell you why it's Appalachia, because the coal miners union activity. At any rate, a whole bunch of unemployed people wanting to get good jobs supplied by Kingsport. The Kingsport union goes out and strike demanding higher wages. Totally crazy, sort of like a kamikaze assault. Because there's no way you have a heavy, there's, there's, see, the, the, the printers always have the, the, the have propounded the doctrine, you have to take years to be a good printer. You have to use an apprenticeship, it's like being a, like being a physician. It's a lot of baloney, you can train a good printer in a couple of months. And of course, the printing people knew that. So when the printers went out on strike, first of all, unions couldn't use violence because in the South, you, know, you can't get away with that. You, can't, you don't own the streets, so to speak. So they had to take their chances. And, this, and the Kingsport press simply hired more workers and trained them in a couple of months. And that was it. Workers are very happy. They're getting good jobs. Hey, we got a great job at Kingsport, at the Kingsport printing plant. And the union, the strike is still going, supposedly, but it's not, they just faded away. It was officially, they're still on strike 20 years later, 10 years later. In practice, they've all, they're all gone. The unions shut up shop and left. So, in the classic, if you look at the classic pattern of, of unions, there was no way they could win it. It was really like a suicide squad. They couldn't use violence. They couldn't restrict the supply because there's plenty of heavy unemployment in the area. Uh, and so why do they do it? Interesting question. Were they totally dumb? Were they crazy? No, they weren't. But what happened was unions are now are dominated by the national union. In other words, the way the structure of union power goes is that every union has a national union, whatever it is, the woodworkers union, machinists, automobile workers, whatever, printers, they've got a national union which has the locus of power. Each, the nationals have a bunch of locals, which are mostly dominated by the national. The national can tell them what to do. Uh, locals in different regions and whatever. Uh, the national often join a federation. In our case, right now, it's the AF AFL CIO, American Federation of Labor Congress of Industrial Organizations. But the AFL has no power in itself. They try to arbitrate disputes within the national union. The locus of power is the national union, which is represented in the AFL, but they really don't. It's like the UN, in a sense. It's no, there's no government power over the National Union. So um, what happened was this. The, the New York State and, and New England is essentially in many ways decaying areas. In other words, if you ever go in to see textile plants or printing plants or whatever in New England, they're all falling apart. They're like 19th century buildings. Okay? Uh, and they're inefficient. They're too small. They're heavily unionized, which raises their costs, etc., etc. What's happened in the, uh, in the United States over time uh, the Northeast has, has a major, originally a major industrial area. <laughs> In other words, the Northeast Quadrant was industrialized. New York, 
Pennsylvania, Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. And the demand for labor went up as the capital investment went up. Wage rates went up. So we had wage rates higher in the Northeast than in the South. Like the South was less, much less industrialized. In that kind of situation, the trend over time, so over the long run, remember, long run equilibrium, is for workers to leave the South and go to the North to get higher, more jobs, higher wage rates. And for capital to leave the North, be attracted to the South with lower wage rates. So we have a, a, a sort of a mutual flow here, tending in the long run toward equality of wage rates. In the very long run, you have tend toward equalization of standard of living. <clears throat> so, of course, Southern people have migrated to the North and Capital, especially in, in inefficient in industries, begins to migrate to the South. I already talked about how minimum wage laws acted as a tariff, um, in a sense, trying to cripple Southern competition. So what happens is, in Kingsport, Tennessee, for example, we have a brand new modern plant, no unions, lower wage costs, lower everything costs, higher productivity, outcompeting these uh, inefficient backward companies in New York and New England. And so the New York headquarters told the local down here, well, well first of all, what happened was the printers of the printing companies in New York and New England went to the union and said, look, we're being outcompeted by these guys in North Carolina, Tennessee, and whatever. Do something about it. Try to cripple them. In other words, try to impose higher labor costs on the South. If you can't do it through a federal minimum wage law. You do it through the, trying to unionize them. Try your best try to unionize them so we can get rid of their competition. So the National Union gives an order to their local in Kingsport, Tennessee, strike for higher wage rates, even though they... They had nothing to lose. I mean, the National Union had nothing to lose. They're sacrificing the Kingsport locals, so to speak. You know? Okay, go for it. <laughs> uh, chances are low. We can do anything about it. We, you know, we, we, we have nothing to lose. Only, only the Kingsport people have something to lose. And sure enough, of course, they collapse. But the whole thing was a, was a collusion between the printers, the northern printers, the northern uh, employers, and the northern union trying to get the crippled southern competition, uh, trying to get unionized the south. Now, this is a story which, uh, which repeats itself all throughout industry. In other words, instead of unions versus capitalists, what usually happens is it's capitalists plus unions trying to screw the rest of us, either through tariffs or through minimum wage law, or through imposing unionization on other parts of the industry, et cetera, et cetera. Time and again, this is what happens. It violates the Marxian myth that somehow you have solidarity of the workers as against the capitalists. Uh, <clears throat> I promise how much... Let's just start on the coal miners' union. We all know about Appalachia and its very heavy unemployment in the, in the coal fields, really, of Kentucky and West Virginia, et cetera. What happened was, this is all deliberately brought about, more or less, by John L. Lewis, who was the brilliant uh, head of the mine work, United Mine Workers' Union, which came in in the 1930s. I already mentioned the Arsene LaGuardia Act. There's another act, even more important, which I'll get to next time, the Wagner Act, as a result of which uh, John L. Lewis was able to, to unionize the bituminous coal workers for the first time successfully, he goes into a pact with the, with the large mine operators, basically saying this. The all, all Lewis was interested in is maximizing the wage rate of his union workers with se seniority. That's what he cared. He didn't care about anybody. He didn't care about young people, about non-union people. He didn't care about any of that stuff. So essentially, he colluded with the mi large miner, mine owners to push the wage rates way up, thereby imposing higher wage costs on the small mines and putting them out of business, which is what the large miners wanted to do. You, you screw your competition by having a national national bargaining rate, national bargaining uh, wage rate for the entire coal industry, <clears throat> push up the wage rate, put, bankrupt the smaller mi coal mines, and cause unemployment for, for all younger mine workers. In other words, those with that seniority, those growing up who just want to get a job right now, unemploy them. Lewis didn't care. He knew, he, Lewis understood about the demand curve, and it's a very well, by the demand curve, by causing unemployment. He didn't care. What he wanted to do was maximize the Pension funds and the, which the letters that the union leaders then stole later on, stole from <laughs> the, the Boodle Fund, maximize the benefits for the existing workers of seniority and help everybody else. As a result of that, we had massive unemployment and massive bankruptcies in the coal fields in Pennsylvania, and some West Virginia, and Kentucky, and the rest of it, which really created a whole Appalachia problem. There was no real Appalachia problem before. It wasn't exactly a flourishing area, but it wasn't a massive area of poverty and unemployment before John L. Lewis colluded with the mine owners to, to bring this about. Now, next time we'll start, we'll talk about the Wagner Act. This is the key thing which changed the whole face of unionism. Market <coughs> and uh, government intervention in it. Uh, in the mid-1930s, the uh, federal government massively intervened in the labor market to, to substitute for a free labor market a government-dominated dominated one, a controlled one, <coughs> 
there are two basic, two major pieces of legislation that this is pressed by. The first and less important was the Norris LaGuardia Act in 1932, which prohibited and still does prohibit federal injunctions in labor disputes and really just court injunctions, period, because states followed after the federal government on this. So, <clears throat> uh, which means that you can't take a union to court and have an injunction to uh, prevent it from engaging in violence and strike situations. So, prohibiting injunctions. Um, <clears throat> of course, it also prohibits uh, employers from using violence, and since they almost never do, but this really means in labor is in, uh, uh, eliminating the most effective weapon against anybody engaging in uh, continuing patterns of violence, uh, which almost always means labor unions. Uh, <coughs> the, um, by the way, one of the reasons why so many unions are controlled by the organized crime is that or because the union activity engages in unions engage in activity which organized crime is also very expert in, like violence and <laughs> con controlling the labor supply. In other words, keeping excluding some groups of workers and, and half of other groups of workers, which is something organized crime is quite expert in doing. So uh, it's sort of a natural field for organized crime to work in. <coughs> uh, <coughs> also, the unions have built up huge pension funds, which um, uh, since the 30s, which of course is a nice plum for people to get a hold of. Uh, at any rate, the, uh, the most important uh, mechanism came in 1935 with the Wagner Act, which is still on the books. It's been modified a little bit, but the basic, the basic Wagner Act uh, uh, provisions still uh, hold. Basically, what the Wagner Act does <clears throat> is it compels co collective bargaining. Okay, compels collective bargaining. By the way, the textbooks, every textbook that I know of, uh, misleads every misleads you about what the Wagner Act says. It usually says the Wagner Act is a Magna Carta for labor because it guarantees the right of collective bargaining. That's baloney. Uh, unions always had the workers always had the right of collective bargaining in the United States. They didn't have it in Britain until 1906. The United States <coughs> workers always had the right to form unions and try to bargain. But so what the Wagner Act does is compel bargaining by employers and by other by non-union workers. In other words, compels collective bargaining, forced collective bargaining. <clears throat> uh, with a union that has a majority of workers uh, in a bargaining unit. Uh, that's, that's the basic, all the provisions of the, of the national, this by the way is officially called the National Labor Relations Act. Wagner Act for short, after Senator Wagner of New York. National Labor Relations Act. <clears throat> uh, in a bargaining unit. All the provisions are logically deduce, deducible from this basic axiom, in other words, basic fundamental clause, fundamental essence of, of the Wagner Act, to compel collective bargaining where the union has the majority of, a working, of workers in a bargaining unit. You know, the first question is, of course, what's a bargaining unit? Good question. Because that's the, it's up to the government to decide what a bargaining unit is. It's not a natural situation. <clears throat> and so the, the, the Migrant Act is administered by National Labor Relations Board, appointed by the federal government, NLRB for short, <clears throat> which decides <clears throat> what a bargaining unit is. See, it's not automatic. For example, take, for example, say the steel industry. Here's a steel, U.S. steel, let's say, steel company, and there's a there's machinists in, working in a steel, uh, steel plant, which want to have their own union, machinist union, which is a craft union, a traditional construction, uh, uh, craft union construction industry. They want their own union. The steel workers then form as an industrial union, steel union, workers union. They want to include everybody. They want to represent everybody working in the steel industry, regardless of what occupation they're in. Machinists want to have their own union. Okay? The, Steel workers union, which are as an industrial union, we'll get to that in a minute. <coughs> Contrast to a craft union. <coughs> now, the craft union wants to exclude people. Craft union supply, or gets its power by excluding, pushing the supply curve to the left and, and, and pushing wage rates up at the expense of workers who are excluded. 
industrial union tries to maximize, tries to include everybody, tries to maximize the number of people in the union. So that immediately goes against the craft unions. The question is, what is the bargaining unit? What's well, up to the NLRB to decide? If they decide the machinists are their own bargaining unit, then the machinist union will win. If they decide the bargaining unit is the whole plant, the the steel workers union will win. Or if they decide the whole, they can decide the whole industry, the whole firm. Uh, a firm might have uh, 20 plants in it. So is the bargaining unit the plant? Is it the whole firm? Is it the whole industry? In some cases, they decide the whole industry is the bargaining unit. So it's purely arbitrary, and, and this, the, it depends then on the ideology of National Labor Relations Board members. Basically, it. In the 1930s, when the NLRB was formed, it was a very left-wing period, and the NLRB was very left-wing. So they always decided against craft unions in favor of industrial unions. They always decided in favor of maximizing union membership. <clears throat> but this, is, this, of course, is not not necessarily has to, have to be that way. It depends again on, on how the NLRB members see it. I think there are five members, and they have a staff and all that sort of stuff. And they have regional locals and all that sort of thing. But basically, they have their they have their appointed members, and they can decide whichever they, way they want. So it's not it's not obvious what a bargaining unit is. Right? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I mean, who decides who has the majority? Well, the NLRB has to call an election. And they have the majority in an officially sanctioned election, which the NLRB holds at a certain date. They don't have to hold a certain date. They, have, they can decide when they, whether or not to hold an election and when to hold it. So, in other words, you have unlimited power virtually going to the guys in the NLRB who, who have the power to interpret these vague provisions. Um, so another thing that happens is that the Compels collective bargaining. So what's collective bargaining? They have to decide what collective bargaining is. It's also not very obvious. What does it mean? Well, in the old days, during the 30s and 40s, the left liberals in the heyday, if an employer said, well, they have to meet with a union, how often does he have to meet with them? Who knows? And it was originally, in the 30s and 40s, it was decided that the, if the employer doesn't offer a wage increase, that he's not bargaining in, quote, in good faith, unquote. In other words, he has to bargain in good faith. I think that's in the law. So what does good faith mean? It's a very subjective kind of decision. So usually if the employer didn't come in, didn't offer a wage increase, this was considered not in good faith. It wasn't really bargaining. It was illegal. Of course, uh, so in other words, this whole sort of mandates constant wage increases. <clears throat> um, the, um, nowadays, nowadays, of course, in the last 20 years or so, it's been very different. And uh, there are many conservatives in the NLRB, or anti-union, or non-union, or whatever it is. And so they, they now, of course, What's been happening, especially since the recession of 1980, 1981, is that the uh, employer comes in and demands a wage cut. This has been happening in the last four or five years. And in the last few years now, the unions are no longer that happy with the NLRB. They used to love it. They used to call it the Magna Carta of Labor's Rights. Well, and now they see the NLRB can rule against them and decide, well, uh, yeah, why, why can't you come in with a wage cut? Why not? And offer a wage cut. And then they have to bargain. So this question of how often they have to meet, what does bargaining good faith mean? For example, in General Electric around 1960s, uh, uh, the famous Vice President of Public uh, Personnel Relations, Lem Boulware, Lemuel Boulware, came up with a theory of Boulwareism. Boulwareism is said, look, what you do is present, when you come to the, way, the bargaining table, telling employers, give them your final offer first. In other words, this is the offer and that's it. Take it or leave it. And we offer a 10, 10% wage increase or 5% wage cut or whatever it happens to be. And don't bargain any further. Well, this is a big, so this, this has been adopted by, quite successful, adopted by many employers. And the question is, is this really legal? Is it bargaining good faith to present one offer? Well, if you don't say it's bargaining good faith, well, how many offers are you supposed to present? So you, how many, you, so the whole thing is very murky. And indeed, it was declared legal by the NLRB. But the point is, none of these things are, are obvious. <clears throat> Another thing, Compelling collective bargaining also was interpreted as meaning in the statutes that the employer cannot discriminate against union organizers. So it's illegal. In other words, if you're going to have an election, and have a free and fair election, so to speak, then, they, then they, it was declared illegal to discriminate against union organizers. So that's how they couldn't fire union organizers. Um, and... Um, it meant they couldn't keep a blacklist in the old non-union days. Employees could keep a blacklist uh, so that if, you know, if Joe Zilch as a militant union, union organizer, his name would be even his name would be set to other employers. Watch out for Joe Zilch, he's a, he's a bad apple. This is now illegal. It's also illegal to discriminate. It's also, it's also as part of this was interpreted by NLRB to mean that employers have to present have to supply union organizers with, with, with meeting halls on the plant property. 
It's kind of a peculiar situation. Here the employer, let's say, doesn't want, doesn't want to have a union. Yet he's compelled by the law to, to, to provide the union organizers with a hall with leaflet space, you know, that sort of stuff. Is that their, their point of view? Also, in the heyday of the 30s and 40s, as the employers would apply the free speech as is interpreted to, to employ free speech in an article about 20 years ago and so forth and so on. Uh, as a result of this compulsory collective bargaining system, union membership, which had been, as you remember, between 2 and 8 percent, it was around 3 percent when the, when the uh, NLRB was, NLRIA was passed, skyrocketed. And during the late 30s, and also during World War II, when the was a war labor board which compelled union had compulsory unionization for defense plants or war plants. As a result of this of this kind of uh, privileging of unions, the percentage of membership uh, percentage union membership of the labor force, which had, as you remember, fluctuated from about two to eight percent, suddenly increased to about Skyrock up to about 25%, I think it was the maximum, something like that. It's a, a lot depends on how you define, how you, if you include agricultural workers and government employees in there. But anyway, around 25% by 1945. This is, of course, a quantum leap. In other words, all of a sudden, unionism becomes an important part of the American economic system, which it really wasn't before, due to the fact we have a, a government regulated labor market instead of a free labor market. <coughs> um, and the unions which came in during the late 30s, 35, were mostly industrial unions, which are, again were favored by the NLRB, which try to include everybody in the, in the industry. The steel workers union, the rubber workers union, the electrical workers union, the bituminous coal workers union, you know, and mine workers, et cetera, et cetera. All this, these mass organizing drives, this is very dramatic also. So it was a very dramatic organizing drive, the automobile, steel industry, automobile industry, coal mine, et cetera, et cetera. So all these came in in the late 30s. Since the AFL was structured in favor of craft unions and against industrial unions, they formed their own group, late 30s, called the CIO, or the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Notice the industrial organization is the key term. So distinguish that from the craft union. So politically, the uh, CIO unions were pretty leftist in the late 30s and 40s, and they were, uh, let's say, organized along different lines. Um, the, um, in the late, after World War II, the communists who controlled a lot of the CIO unions were kicked out uh, by the union people. And after, by around the 50s or 60s, somewhere around there, the two of them, AFL and CIO, began to sort of merge, began to sort of peacefully coexist, and finally merged again to form the current AFL CIO. They still have jurisdictional disputes, but more or less they try and iron it out. So now we have the. Uh, uh, Umbrella union, including the old AFL and the, and the, and the newer CIO. Uh, the CIO, by the way, is the first organization to set up political action committees, uh, PACs, which are now, of course, all over the place, set up by corporations and all sorts of other organizations. <coughs> uh, well, since the, since World War II, uh, unionism has gone to steady decline, even with the Wagner Act. Uh, it's been declining ever since. It's now down to about 18 percent, something like that. It's, it's a long-run decline. Uh, there are many reasons for this. There's a, for one thing, with a greater affluence, people less interested in unions. For another thing, of course, there's been a shift of the economy toward the Southwest, which is, has never been particularly unionized, and toward uh, new high-tech industries, computers, uh, and whatever, calculators, et cetera, et cetera, and, and toward white-collar jobs, engineers, and so forth. Which have never been particularly unionized, and union, uni, unionizable. So, uh, in other words, as the old smokestack industries decline, as the old assembly line type industries decline, you have more and more service industries and engineering and professional uh, occupations. Uh, unions keep are steadily in decline, and probably will continue doing so, despite all frequent you know, repeated hysteria on the part of unions. How do we do something? We're going to do something to reverse it. Uh, what the so what the uh, I, might, I, I maintain that most of the industrial unions have no real economic power, since they don't restrict the supply of members. Even though they make a lot of noise and have a lot of publicity and so forth, they don't really, they don't really increase the wage rates of their members, uh, as the craft unions can do. I mentioned already you know, about the faculty and the staff here, sort of a microcosm. Uh, they talk a lot and have a lot of uh, 
members and a lot of and some bureaucrats, I mean, but, but but they really didn't have much power. <clears throat> um, so what the industrial unions do, the, the, what the success of the industrial union basically is they have a lot of voting power. They can they can they're politically powerful because so they have a lot of voters, which craft unions don't. Uh, so they vote, and they have a big union bureaucracy, the big union dues and huge union bureaucracy of uh, who are very well paid at the top and who. Uh, and they have a whole network of sort of professional union bureaucrats. So you have a, a, a union as, unions in the United States are now very different from what they, what they were in the 30s. They're much less politically, much less ideological, much less leftist. And also they, they sort of bureaucrats. And they're sort of people who often go to college and never work. Say if you're head of a pipe fitter's union, you're often never a pipe fitter. You never see a pipe. You go to MBA, you become an MBA or whatever. You become a labor expert. And you become head of or vice president of some uh, steam fitters union or, or coal union, but you know you've never seen a steam fit. <laughs> so and this, of course, sets up resentment on the part of the workers because uh, they begin to feel they're not only quote exploited by the employer, unquote, they're also exploited by the union, their own union, who is for, for forcing them to pay heavy dues to set, to, to, to set these people up and, and where they really don't accomplish much. Uh, they don't really raise the wage rates of the workers. So there's a lot of friction and uh, with with the uh, the old egalitarian spirit of unions is long gone. They have you know, big plush offices and all the rest of it. So, uh, um, so we have. There's also been, of course, a, a falling back or a loss of union spirit, union solidarity, union spirit. Um, most people are not that pro-union anymore. It used to be that everybody, never, nobody would cross the picket lines. Everybody thought unions were great. Now even liberals are pretty sour on unions. Unions don't have, they don't have the mystique they had in the 30s and 40s. Uh, when the Republicans first took over Congress in 1946 for the first time since 1930, uh, they had been pledged to repeal the Wagner Act, get rid of this whole system. They didn't do it. What they did is they added some stuff in 1948 called the Taft-Hartley Act, which is really just an amendment of the Wagner Act. It's an addition to it. So we have now a Wagner-Taft-Hartley structure. I think this is 48. And um, what the Taft Hartley Act is, is they essentially they added stuff on top. In other words, in addition to in addition to unfair labor practices by by employers, unions can now engage in unfair labor practices. In other words, unions now are, are now being regulated as well as employers. Uh, for example, if unions are too blatant, unions have to have elections once in a while. They don't lose them, but they <laughs> it's now it's now considered unfair labor practice not, never to have an election. See, in the old days, most unions never had an election. You come in, you're union president. It was a great saying in the labor movement. I mean, once a union president, always a union president. Once you get into power, you're there for life. And it's still more or less true, even with elections. In some cases, like the United Mine Workers, there's been a big, there's big changes. But in most cases, once you get in, you're there, you're there forever. You can never be dislodged. It's not like you have a political machine. <clears throat> uh, so, and also, they can't engage in too much racial discrimination. As like they still engage to some, some extent. There's, in other words, a certain amount of certain curves now in union through. So essentially, what the Wagner, the NLRB, has added to its power, they've kept the, the same Wagner Act provisions and added on union regula provisions regulating unions. Um, the closed shop is now illegal. The closed shop in a situation where you can't get a job unless you belong to a union first. In other words, you can't. The equivalent would be you couldn't get a job as a, as a poly professor unless you first joined the AUP. Uh, or any other occupation. That's now illegal, but the union shop is still legal. So the union shop is, you can get a job on your own, but then you have to join the union for, and within 30 days, whatever the provision is. So it's basically the same thing. It's slightly less restrictive, a closed shop, but it's not too, not too different. Uh, then there's other provisions that you're probably familiar with. You can't you have a strike against the, if you're a government employee strike, you have to wait 30 days. There's various provisions of slowing down strikes, but that's, these are mostly sort of marginal provisions. The, the key provisions are still there. The Wagner Act provisions are still there. Uh, now, the various um, state states which have passed, which have outlawed the union shop too. A whole bunch of states, I forget now, mostly in the southwest and the mountain states. Um, which just seems to me it goes against private property and a free market. Because what you're doing when you outlaw the union shop, you're preventing the employer from sign, voluntarily signing an agreement with the union saying we, we will only have union workers. The various reasons why many employers are pro-union. Uh, for example, the uh, take for example the, the poor Metropolitan Opera. Every every few years, there's a strike against Metropolitan Opera. They have to confront about 30 craft unions. Each one has a, which has a different contract deadline. 
as a stagehands union, the actors union, the scene designers union, so forth, so forth and so on. And each one of them can strike, and, and none of them is bound by the other people, and each one will then will also honor the picket line of the other union. So, so, the, so the employer, the Metropolitan Opera, has to confront about 30 different unions, which is only ever extremely difficult. They'd much rather have one union, just make an agreement with that, and that will that'll end it. Um, so many employers tend to favor industrial unions, even, because they figure craft unions are just too many of them to deal with, too feisty, uh, and too much economic power, in a sense. There's one classic case. So in other words, some employers were all in favor of the Wagner Act. Most of them were against it. And various employers who were pro-corporate state, pro-business industry partnership, so to speak, were in favor of the Wagner Act. Um, there was one classic case of this, this whole situation where uh, Gerard Swope, who was head of General Electric for many years, uh, wrote a letter to William Green, who was head of the American Federation of Labor. This was written in the late, late, late 1920s. Please, Mr. Green, why don't you organize General Electric? Come in and organize it, because we have too many craft unions here. In other words, we have you know, machinists have to deal with these four or five unions. Why don't you come with one union and just organize the whole General Electric, and then we can have an agreement? Uh, and Green wrote back and said, God bless you, Mr. Swope. We love you. You're a great pro-union person. However, we can't do it because we're committed to the craft union. We can't form an industrial union. So when the CIO came in, people like Swope helped write it and lobbied for it, because then you say, well, okay, we'll deal with one industrial union in General Electric and make an agreement. And the workers are going to have to shut up. Now, there's many cases the, uh, the employer prefers dealings, I say, with one union. And if the union uh, is willing to collaborate, so to speak, they can just you know, form so-called sweetheart agreements and uh, where all the workers will then be committed to it uh, because of this collect compulsory collective bargaining. The individual worker can often be screwed here because they can often suffer from the fact that the, the union organizer or the union, the national union, is in favor of of a mild, uh, mild wage increase or whatever. <clears throat> so there's, con there's also constant conflict from below on this sort of, this sort of basis. Uh, there's right now a big strike that's been going on for the last eight months in Austin, Minnesota, which is a small city in a prairie out there, of uh, the Hormel plant, which is a big food manufacturer. And uh, the local is all in favor of a big strike. I've been striking. The National Union is very much against it. The National Union is going to put the local in a trusteeship any day now. In other words, crack down on and displace the, um, the leadership. And the local swear to fight on. There's a whole big struggle over this, of the local versus national. Uh, and as I've already said here, the national union is, a, is always a big power center, and locals have very little power. So there's a big fight over this. Uh, one of the classic things that happened, uh, maybe I mentioned this already, but they, this is the result of the, I mentioned John L. Lewis and the United Mine Workers Union yet? No. Um, the bituminous coal industry, they try to have a United Mine Workers in the bituminous coal industry. It was never successful because of the free market. In other words, they organize some few coal mines in Pennsylvania, the, the wage rate would go up, the cost would go up. they go bankrupt, they'd be outcompeted by non-union mines in West Virginia or whatever. So the United Mine Workers Union didn't succeed until the Wagner Act came in, which then uh, compelled collective bargaining and then set forth the conditions, set up the conditions for a successful union. The uh, head of the United Mine Workers was uh, John L. Lewis, a famous bushy browed figure, uh, Welshman, Welsh American, who, um, who understood about the demand curve. He was brilliant. He understood about the whole demand curve and the, and the demand for labor. He understood that this is wage rate, quantity of labor hired that the only way to raise wage rates for, for, by union activities is, is to cut the supply, shift the supply to the left at the expense of diminished employment. Okay. And um, in other words, he realized that the, the union action pushing up the wage rates will unemploy a whole bunch of coal miners. He didn't care about that. He was all in favor of it because his go object was to maximize the income, wage income for, his, for those union workers with seniority. In other words, those were have been in the union for 10 years or something. At the expense of younger workers, those who didn't have seniority, and, and new people coming up, younger people who, you know, teenagers who were coming uh, of age and wanting to become, get a job in a coal mine. He didn't care about that. What he wanted to do was to maximize the income of existing union members of seniority. So he had industry-wide bargaining with the coal miner, the whole coal mining association. The coal miners, the large coal mine operators, we won't favor this. They're in favor of higher wage rates to impose crippling higher costs on their small competitors, small miners, and they realized couldn't pay it. So in other words, they had industry-wide agreements between the, between the coal, coal operators 
and the coal union tremendously pushing up wage rates and uh, leading to the bankruptcy of the small mines, total depression in the coal mine industry, bankruptcy of the small mines, and massive unemployment in the coal fields, which continues to this day. It's the so-called Appalachia problem. Uh, there was no Appalachian problem before the unions came in, or the coal mining unions came in. Because uh, the coal mining industry was the major employing, employing center in, in that whole area. So as a result, you have depression in the coal industry, and but the, but the, the large operators continue. The union members continued on with seniority. They were in great shape. And they sort of rode into the, into the sunset, destroying the entire industry in its wake, but building up a huge pension fund and everything else to, to be looted by the union uh, organizers. Uh, so here's an, a, a beautiful example, a crystal clear example of how of the, of the myth, of the Marxian myth that the, the workers are always in solidarity against the employers. The employers are competing with each other for products, for, to sell stuff and to buy stuff, and workers compete against each other, as we saw with immigration restrictions and everything else, and with the uh, craft unions, and with the coal mining situation. When one group of workers benefit the expense of unemployment for the other group, <clears throat> for the younger people coming up. So, uh, so we have collaboration between, in other words, some monopolistic collaboration between the between large employers and, uh, and the union, similar to the collaboration between the printing union member and the and the, and the, and the uh, printing employers in, in New York, New England, to try to hobble to try to impose higher costs on the southern uh, efficient southern printers, Kingsport strike. So similar things happen will happen in the coal uh, coal situation. Um, okay. So the uh, the whole Appalachia problem is really a product of the mine workers or the mine worker um, employer large employer collaboration in the 40s and 50s and 60s. <clears throat> um, uh, most of the uh, increase, whatever increase in unions there have been in the last 20 years, has been in government employee unions, which is really not exactly not really the same thing as. Uh, I mean, that depends on what the government's willing to pay. And it's, not, it's hardly an employer versus employer uh, employee situations. It's how much the, the, the government official, the taxpayers, or whatever, are willing to shell out. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the only union growth has really been in that in the government employee area. <clears throat> uh, this, of course, has also made a government caught very costly, like the post office and garbage collection. And so there's now a, a big drive toward privatization. We used to, the, the people get fed up with paying very high garbage costs or whatever, and they, and they contract out to... Uh, Private firms, which are either non-union, well, even if they're unionized, they don't have the same sort of clout as the government unions. They're simply, because since the taxpayer pays, the government doesn't really care. He'd be a nice guy. But if he's a government official, they're dealing with big unions, unions with big membership. Say, so, yeah, sure, we'll give you a 20% wage increase. Why not? The taxpayer shoves it out, not the not the guy, not the president or the mayor or the governor. But this has now come to roost. In other words, it's get to a situation where government is so costly that even the government's now looking around for privatizing alternatives. Uh, and so you have garbage collection. Many cities in the United States are private fire companies. Where the government simply contracts out to the fire company instead of the, the fire department. Um, and also, as I've said, the uh, government officials they don't have any real incentive to be efficient of the, of the hope of the benefit of the consumer because they, the taxpayer kicks is forced to kick in. The, uh, the fire. If anybody's had any, any any experience with fire department, for example, in New York, the usual. They usually don't care about the private property they're trying to allegedly trying to save. In other words, the objective is to put the fire out, or else they have to destroy a whole bunch of apartments <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the name of, of putting out the fire. And uh, because then that, there's no there's no there's no consumer payment, you have to rely on the consumer to shell out. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a very different sort of situation with a, with a private the private farm service. Same way, of course, with the mail and all sorts of other uh, government government services. Um, <coughs> I think this is actually sums up the union situation. I say there's no real, there's no the unions, the, the pro-union spirit is more or less uh, dwindled a lot in the United States. You don't have the backing for the stuff. Oh, one more thing I should say about the uh, about unionization. The uh, about 20 years ago there was a famous uh, boycott, a great uh, yeah, great boycott. Uh, Cesar Chavez, one of the unionized the, the grape workers in California and other areas. And so the idea was that we that the consumer should kick in, should should help out the uh, great grape workers union by boycotting grapes. 
Now, the effect of this, of course, if you're boycotting grapes, and here's the demand for grapes. The effect, of course, is to diminish the, you know, cut the supply, the demand curve for grapes. Here's the price of grapes. And, uh, <coughs> reduce it because you're boycotting. Of course, another thing, another peculiar thing about the whole grape thing is this. You can't see, when you look at a grape, you can't tell if it's a union grape or an onion grape. They all look the same. <laughs> There's always, of course, a diminished demand curve for all grapes, including the poor guys who are, un who are who unionized grapes. At any rate, the result of this, of course, is you, know, you cut the demand curve for grapes, shift it to the left, and reduce the profits of the, uh, you know, incur losses in the grape industry, and, and the result, the demand curve for grape workers goes down. So the, the result of the boycott is to lower the wage rate for, for grape workers instead of increasing them. Um, now eventually, when they finally knuckle under, it did increase. They did have unionization, did increase the grape, uh, grape unions, although that's, that's sort of been diminished now in the last 10 years. But the interesting thing is that, the, in other words, if you look at the direct action here, boycotting, what boycotting does is it reduces the demand curve or something and thereby lowers the wage rate. So in order to, uh, the goal, the objective was to benefit the grape workers. Instead of that, it really injured the grape workers, at least for the, for the, for the whole period when the boycott was going on. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a very, another, as one, one economist wrote at the time, he said, if you want to really help the grape workers, you should, you should eat as, mon as many grapes as possible. You should increase the demand curve for grapes, which then, of course, increases the demand curve for grape workers and increases their wage rate and increases the employment instead of the other way around, which cuts the wage rate and cuts the employment. So boycotts are generally a self-defeating way of going, of trying to benefit uh, the workers involved. <coughs> and uh, at least while the boycott is going on, you can say, well, if the boycott is victorious, it helps them. That's kind of a, you know, I'm not sure the great workers are really consulted about this uh, in, in depth. <laughs> at least, at least the, the full, con I'm not sure the full consequences were spelled out to them before the boycott got underway. Um, this is the trouble, by the way, of all boycotts in general. The boy the ide an ideological boycott, say a boycott of, of Russia or South Africa or whatever, the problem is it doesn't help the workers who are involved in this thing. That when it doesn't, it cuts the demand curve and thereby reduces their wages and their and their employment. So that um, it's a very, it's a very tricky kind of weapon to use. It's a weapon which is much more um, self-indulgent. It's a weapon which is usually employed by people far removed from the action, uh, who don't see the consequences on the on the people involved. Uh, Okay, we now uh, we now cover the union question. The next step on a you can only deal with all to some extent. We, we, the next step is to talk about the supply of labor. Talk about the union and the effect on supply of labor. Supply of labor and uh, population. In other words, one of the big determinants of labor supply, of course, is the number of people around. And so the question then is uh, question of population growth, which about 10 years ago was a big thing. Um, there were a lot of, uh, the, the, the opinion on population growth has fluctuated a lot in the 20th century. Uh, usually in the old days, the idea was the bigger the population, the better. <clears throat> and uh, then with the Malthusian theory, this is the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus, He's a, an English uh, minister and economist around late 18th, early 19th century. And then writing in a period, interesting enough, writing in a period of a tremendous industrial revolution where population was going up and standards of living were going up at the same time. Writing in this period around 1790s, Malthus concluded that the world is going to hell because of increased population growth. The way he put it was, uh, his famous phrase was that the, the population tends to grow geometrically. In other words, it tends to double and what a quadruple and whatever, as everybody has two kids or four kids and they have, each one of them has four kids. You have sort of a skyrocketing or exponential increase in population, whereas the food supply grows only arithmetically. It only grows, I guess, more moderately. It's a very peculiar uh, construction, but anyway. Uh, so the population grows geometrically, and um, the food supply grows arithmetically, and so therefore, he said, population always tends to press on the food supply. People are tending to die out. In other words, uh, um, people are always down at subsistence level, if that. And as population presses on the food supply, uh, this causes famine, wars, because everybody's you know warring for the for the only you know, water hole left and that sort of thing, killing each other off of the scarce food. 
and um, disease and, and famine, all these things are coming in their wake, which tends to cut, keep the population down, down. In other words, as population becomes excessive, people kind of die out, they starve, there's diseases, and they kill each other. So this is the, well, it's a very gloomy picture, of course, of, of uh, world history. <coughs> Uh, the peculiar thing, he wrote this just at a time in a period when the population was going up, indeed, but when the food, when standard living was going up. He wrote it, it's very odd for the guy to write this just as standard living was taking off into the stratosphere for the first time in, you know, 500 years. In other words, what you really had is the population remained about the same in, in Europe, about, about constant from about, until from about 1000 AD until about 1750. This is a simplification, but basically it's what it is. It didn't really fluctuate much. It didn't keep increasing. We're used to a situation where population is always going up. It didn't happen. Uh, 1750 is sort of taking off, doubling every 30 years or so. And the reason is because the standard of living went up. You know, that's basically the reason we'll go into. Uh, so he's writing this thing just at a time when everybody, when, when the population was really improving, not only going up, but also improving standard of living. And it's influenced economics. The, the classical economists became Malthusians, always worried about the population pressing on the food supply, just at a time it obviously wasn't pressing on the food supply. Very uh, peculiar, typical of economists, I think, to, to worry about the wrong problem at the wrong time. At any rate, uh, in uh, the, early, the early 20th century, uh, as, the po as, the pop as the population growth, population started declining in Western Europe, in France and other places in Western Europe, population was declining, and so the theoreticians started bellyaching about race suicide, as they call it. The, the world's going to die out. What they do is they project trends. They say, well, if the French population is going down by 2% a year or something, it means in 80 years the French France will be wiped out. In other words, given the <laughs> existing rate, uh, you simply extrapolate the trend. You say, well, gee, France will, be, will disappear in 80 years or 100 years, whatever it is. Uh, this, by the way, is the way, especially the way demographers operate. It's a very, it's a very simplistic uh, we just take existing trends and extrapolate them, and of course you can have any sort of horror or result. So then they started having bounties for kids in France and other parts of Western Europe, subsidized number of kids, because they were also worried about cannon fodder. In other words, they're worried if the French population declines, how are they going to fight? How are you going to conscript people in the army if there's no people to be conscripted? So they started giving bounties for kids, you know, give you a thousand dollars per kid born. Uh, and this indeed tended to turn around the population growth. <coughs> And about 10, 15, 20 years ago, they started a ZTG hysteria. Namely, the population is growing too fast, and it won't have any room to stand on. We'll be, we'll disappear. Uh, we'll all be starving. So therefore, we should limit population growth now. There's a big so-called ZTG movement, namely that calling for zero population growth. Okay, we'll resume this next time, next Tuesday.